Well, it's good to see you all here this morning. We're going to get right back into the book of Genesis. As, as we do here at Grace, we go through the Bible chapter at a time, verse at a time, and we look at it in its context so that we know what it is that God says instead of me cherry-picking stuff out and manufacturing something for you. I figure it'd be better to hear from God, right? So let's do that. If you guys would uh, just pray with me. Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity to be here. We know, Lord, as we come before your presence that we really are so, so far below you, that you are so high above us, and we're so undeserving of your attention and of your love, and yet you encourage us in your word to come boldly before the throne where we find help and grace in time of need. And Lord, uh, we have needs. You know the pains that we carry. You know the malignancy of our souls. You know our joys. And Lord, you beckon us to come home. I pray that today you would speak to our hearts as we look at your word, as we look at this recounting of the history of people you have worked in before, that we would see you and we would see ourselves that you would help us to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for your love towards us that was demonstrated by giving your only son so that we might have life and a relationship with you. Thank you you didn't leave us to our own to be good enough because we could never be good enough. I pray that you help us and help me, Lord, especially as we go through this, that I might speak boldly, that I might speak plainly, and that your spirit might work in all of our hearts to apply these things to be like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are, we are in Genesis chapter 21. We have seen how God called Abraham, called him out of Ur of the Chaldees and away from his family, and how he has been walking with him every step of the way. We see Abraham make some colossal mistakes, much like you and I, and yet, God is faithful to him anyway. How many of you can identify with that? Amen. And so we're going to look at, finally, the long-awaited birth of Isaac, which is, it's been 25 years since the Lord spoke to him originally and said, you're going to have a son. I'm going to come and see you, and at the right time, Sarah's going to bear a son. And you remember what Abraham did when he heard that. He laughed. Later on, with some angels showed up at his house and said, I'm going to stop by a year from now, and Sarah's going to have a child. You remember what Sarah did? She laughed. So guess what his name means? Laughter. laughter. That's right. Isaac means laughter, which is uh, it's kind of cool the way God does that. And he says, call him Isaac, because you guys keep laughing about this. All right, let's see if I can work this thing. By the way, just in case you forgot where you were, last week, I'm going to go through this very quickly. You remember Abimelech, which is actually a, p a person, but it's a position. Abimelech has a position. He's the son of the king. Melech means king, and Abi means son of. So he was the son of the king, and so he's the prince, but I don't know that he wants you to call him that. Just call him Abimelech. He ends up seeing Abraham come into the neighborhood. He's bringing his sister with him and says, you know, your sister's pretty good looking. I think uh, I'd like to try her on for size, bring her into the palace and see if she's marriage material. And so he basically absconds with her and takes her. So this Abimelech, or Abimelech, he takes Sarah into his house because of a lie that Abraham said. And he said, this is my sister and not his wife because he didn't want to get killed and have somebody take over all the stuff, including his wife. But if it was his sister, he's due a little cash, you know, the dowry. And so he lies, and then Abimelech comes and takes Sarah, takes her. It's good to be king. He just comes and takes her. <laughs> and so in the dream, Abimelech has this dream, and the Lord tells him, you're dead because you took another man's wife. You're done. I'm taking you out. And you can imagine, having no knowledge that he did anything wrong, how surprised he was. 
And so he's now afraid. <laughs> he's afraid because God told him the truth, and now he's afraid of God's wrath. But the funny thing is, Abimelech didn't do anything. He didn't do anything. And we see Abraham lied because he was afraid. And we talked a little bit about fear and where that comes from and how a lot of us experience unnecessary fears, things that we've experienced, traumas that we've gone through, things we've been told, uh, lies that we believe about ourselves or about our abilities or our inabilities or whether God is or isn't for us. And so we saw that that lack of faith is something that causes fear and that is what causes us to trip up. It is the sin that so easily entangles us as it says in Romans. And so he said, listen, you, you wouldn't destroy an entire good nation too, would you? Uh, and we know he's referring to Sodom, which he had just destroyed. And he says, listen, I did this innocently. And it's interesting because he says, listen, you go talk to Abraham, he'll pray for you and I won't kill you, but you better not touch her. And it's interesting, he says, well, I didn't touch her. And he goes, yeah, I know you didn't touch her because I made you not touch her. It's interesting because he kind of unplugged the libido of all the men in the nation. This happened once before. We saw it with Pharaoh. And so finally, Abimelech's going to face off with him. He goes, what did you do? Why did you lie to me? Why would you say such a thing? Why would you cause my nation and for me to fall into such bad relationship with God? And so here's this unbelieving king facing off with a believer, God's man, Abraham, the father of all the faithful, and is reproving him for his lie. I don't know if you've ever been on the short end of that conversation where you've done something wrong and you got caught and somebody called you on the carpet. That is a miserable feeling. Okay, a couple of you are like me. Okay, I've been on that side and it is a miserable thing. And you wonder what it is that I'm going to do. Well, it's interesting because Abimelech asks him, what were you thinking? What, what were you possibly thinking? And the interesting thing is, he tells him, he goes, well, let me give you the story. This is where I came from, and this is how it was. And God walked me here and there, and I told my wife, just tell him you're my sister, and that will do me a kindness, and, and everything will be fine. I'm not sure that's what Abimelech was looking for. He was looking for something a bit deeper. He was looking for somebody to confess, say, listen, I was wrong. Please forgive me. I'm sorry for what I've done. I repent. I will never do it again. But that's not what Abraham gave him. Abraham gave him a big long story about how he got to where he was, which is more of an explanation than it is a confession. And sometimes that's what we do. We justify ourselves by giving an explanation. What were you thinking? Well, I was thinking this, and then I was thinking that, and I was thinking, that. hey, what, what somebody is owed is an apology and an asking of forgiveness and an offering of repentance. It's not a big long explanation as to how you got to the place that you got. And it's much more of an excuse and an explanation. But what it isn't is a confession. A full confession means you agree with God and you say what he says. And so we looked at that last week. And then Abimelech, believe it or not, God hears Abraham's prayer, even though he's a liar. God hears his prayer and he actually answers it which is an amazing thing. Even though he's not in the right place with God, even though he's fallen short, know that our failures don't affect our relationship with God because it's secured through the life of Jesus Christ, not by our own good works. Amen? Amen. Because if that were the case, we would all be on some really seriously shifting sand. You know, oh, God loves me today because I was good and I didn't do anything really stupid. But as soon as I do something stupid, God hates my guts and I know lightning's coming down. I don't know what book you read that out of, but that isn't what a relationship with God is. When I've been justified with God because of what Jesus Christ did and he took away my sin, I'm free. I'm free of the guilt and shame of the things that I've done in the past and I have the strength to be able to not repeat it because God gives us that to be able to do. And so Abraham intercedes and God heals all of them, and he gets his wife back, and he gets a bunch of stuff. And that's where suddenly God's going to come that he's purged Abraham probably for the last time of his lying. He's now ready to handle having a son. So 25 years later, we're going to pick up the story where Isaac is born. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord said for Sarah... At, 
And the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac, which means he laughs. So laughter is born. Isn't that nice? It's been a long 25 years because God said he would do something. Has God ever spoken to your heart and told you he's going to do something and it took a long time? It took a long time. I remember graduating Bible college and I didn't become a pastor until I was 50. I was in my 20s when I graduated Bible college and the Lord said, I want you to be a pastor. I was like, okay. Except he had to teach me some things and purge me of some things before I could actually do the job. I probably could get the job, but I'm not sure I could do the job. So at least he's equipped me now where I know that there's no good thing in me and if the Lord causes anything good to come out of me, it's because he put it there. And so after this long time, suddenly laughter is born. That's kind of interesting. They call him laughter. If, if it was a girl, I wonder what they'd name her. Hilarion, maybe? Or... <laughs> In Genesis 18, 14, it says that God came and visited her. In other words, she got pregnant at the exact right time, just like he said. If you remember going back to the three visitors that Abraham has, and one of them being the Lord, if you look at chapter 18, verse 14, the Lord asks him, is there anything too great for the Lord? And at the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. This is that appointment that he said he would meet with her in such a way. And it's a remarkable, miraculous birth because he's 100 and she's 90. She's very young. You know, there's a whole 10 years between them. People say, oh, you shouldn't marry anybody that's so varied in your age. It works when God's in the middle of it. Amen? Amen. I didn't hear any loud ones, but okay. <laughs> and so here is what the Lord does and brings about laughter. He's faithful. He always does what he says he's going to do. If it doesn't happen, it's because we got it wrong. But how many times has the Lord come to Abraham and told him, you're going to have a son. You're going to have a son. If you see the stars, that's how many you'll have. See the grains of sand on the seashore? That's how many you're going to have. If you can count them, then you'll be able to count your descendants. And so Abraham's waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, and now he's 100. If you remember 14 years previously, Sarah said, well, maybe, maybe you got it wrong. Maybe he meant for you to sleep with somebody else and have a child. So here's my maid. Eh, not a good idea. That was not a good idea. And Abraham said, okay, not a good idea. That was not God's plan. This was God's plan, but he didn't want to wait. Why did God wait so long? I think God waited so long so that it was beyond their ability to take any credit. I think he did it as a miraculous thing to be a picture of a much more miraculous birth. It was the birth of Jesus Christ. And it's interesting, Isaac and Jesus have a lot in common, don't they? They were both announced by angels. They were both named before they were born. They both will go on to the same hill to be sacrificed, Jesus being followed through with. And there are at least a dozen others, but you can feel free to look those up. Isaac and Jesus have so much in common, including a miraculous birth, which was foretold. By the way, Isaac was foretold long in advance, wasn't it? it? Wasn't his birth. And so was Jesus. In fact, even further in advance. So there are all these wonderful parallels, these wonderful types, these shadows, these similes, the analogies, the metaphors. You see them all through scripture. So I don't necessarily take every word of the scripture literally, but I take it seriously. Amen. Because sometimes it's a metaphor, sometimes it's an allegory, sometimes it's a type and a shadow. And it's interesting, we'll, we'll look at some of that. Romans 5, 6 says, for when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Notice he came in due time, just like the birth of Isaac. 
Jesus came at just the right time, in just the right way, in just the right place. And we have it all written down for us. The book of Luke tells us that. We've experienced Christmas recently. And then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac. Remember, he gave him the covenant of circumcision when he was eight days old, just like Jesus. Something else they had in common. As God had commanded him. Now, Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh and all who hear will laugh with me. She also said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. So the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. Now, you guys don't know what weaning is, probably. It means no more milk. You're going to eat solid food from now on. That usually happens around two to three years of age, probably because of the growth of teeth. <laughs> Any of you ladies who are breastfed know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's time to wean you. It's done. And so we get all of these years that pass by. So we get about three years that pass by. And now he's going to be weaned. It's kind of a big deal. You know, you're going to be able to eat solid food and not just milk anymore. And so Abraham's going to have a party because any excuse to have a party. And so I can imagine that they're, they're looking at, you know, who they're going to invite and they get everybody there. And, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful occurrence. And, uh, you know, like they do at these things, you know, you're going to line up for a family photo. And so you line up for a family photo and it's you and the wife and the new child and Hagar and Ishmael. Somehow, this woman and her 17-year-old son, 16, 17-year-old son, Sunday school's got it all wrong. You know, they show them being little bitty kids, but they're not. Ishmael's now 16, 17 years old. Do you think they feel a little out of place at this party? All of the fuss and all of the attention is on Isaac, who was the only one that was supposed to arrive but Abraham and his wife, in another way, just undercut trusting God and created a child of their own through a maidservant. And it wasn't a real marriage because nobody gets their wife from their wife. You don't get a wife from your wife. It doesn't work that way. You might get it from her father, from their family, you know, who gives her in marriage. But just because Sarah said, here, have her, make her your wife, doesn't mean they're married. Just thought I'd let you know. Just because there's a sexual union doesn't mean there's a marriage. There are some people that would teach you otherwise. Anytime you unite like that, that's a marriage, man. How many divorces you got on your belt? Doesn't work that way. And so in 1 Peter 2, 2, it exhorts us as newborn babes that we should desire the pure milk of the word that we may grow thereby. It says that we should always have this desire for milk. So do you ever get weaned off the scriptures? Of course not. Do you ever get weaned off the elemental truths of scripture that, hey, I'm a sinner, I need a savior, and Jesus came and died for me? Will you ever get over that? I hope that's always part of your meal because the scripture tells us 1 Peter 2, 2, right? We should always have this desire for the pure milk of the word, which involves the elemental truths about grace and the law and all of these things, which you guys probably know and, and understand, but yet our hearts are refreshed with it all the time. So, I keep forgetting how to work this thing. Hebrews chapter 5 is now going to give us this explanation. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, Paul is exhorting the Hebrews that they should be further along than they are in their maturity. You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. You see, this is an idiom for being immature. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern 
good and evil. Isn't that an interesting passage? When thinking about Isaac and him being weaned, I'm thinking, wow, he's coming into a place of maturity where he's going to actually be able to chew up his own meat and eat it. And the scripture refers to what that means. It means that you should know some of the deeper things of God. Your maturity should be better than those in the Hebrews, which they had to go back to the elemental truths and Paul had to explain to them the simple things of the gospel of Christ. I think we all need to remember it so we don't need to be reminded. And so solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use, you see, it's not by reason of understanding, it's not reason of of reading it, it's using it. You see, because you can read the scriptures, you can have them memorized, you can have a catalog, you know, and just pull it out and chapter and verse it just like that. But it doesn't mean that you put it into your life. That's a much different thing. So you can live a very religious life and have no relationship. It's that relationship which makes everything else work. And without that, it's just a lot of law keeping, which is a drudgery. Like stopping at a red light. I stop because I know it's necessary and I I don't want to die early. But then when the light turns green for the other people and I'm waiting and I'm waiting for mine to turn green and theirs turns red and my light's still red and then their light turns green again, I get a little frustrated. And that's what happens here on Ocean Avenue uh, at, at the end of Thompson and Route 36. I'm, I'm rolling in about 5.30 in the morning and I roll up to the light and it turns red for everybody else and I count one, two, three. It's still red. All right, I'm going to have to wait through two lights. I don't know why they do that. If you know anybody that can change that, please let me know. I'd (laughs) love to have a conversation with them. Anyway, reason of use have their senses exercised both to discern good and evil. We should be growing always, right? There should be mile markers in our life where we're progressing and becoming more like Christ, where the elemental truths of the gospel are no longer the only thing that we feed on. We can understand some of the deeper things of God and our maturity grows. That's the normal timeline. And so Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, scoffing. Therefore, she said to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely Isaac. Be careful what you wish for. Here it was Sarah's idea that he lay with her maidservant to have a child, and now it doesn't seem to be turning out very well. Because the kid who's 16, 17 years old is now mocking the three-year-old. Which tells me several things. Number one, this kid's not being supervised. Number two, it tells me something of the character of the kid. Well, all kids are kind of mean. But to see a 16, 17-year-old picking on a three-year-old, That burns a fire in my gut when I see that. When I just read it, it kind of, where is he? Where is that Ishmael? But Sarah sees this and she goes, these guys got to go. You mean the woman that you gave to him as a wife and this boy that you supposedly adopted as your own are now out? That seems cold. Does anyone else see that as cold? Sarah, grow some grace. Come on. You're like the tin man. You need a heart. And yet, the 16, 17-year-old is mocking the three-year-old. Sarah was upset. (laughs) It's the only angry Sarah I could find as a photo. (laughs) But it works. Sarah was upset. You see somebody picking on your kid, there's something that gets stirred in you, right? Pick on my kid, forget it, you know. Okay, Lord, help me, help me here. And so Sarah was upset. You have to be careful of bullied kids because they grow up and they can become important people like Elon Musk. Did you know he was bullied as a kid? Now he's a billionaire. Be careful who you're not gracious to. 
but also understand that God works all things together for good for those who are called, the called according to his purpose. He will take all of the junk and the stuff that go, goes through your life and he will turn it to gold if you let him. If you let him. And, and so the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight. Well, that's easy to say. Do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Notice, he doesn't call her a wife because according to God, she's not a wife. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. It's interesting, he listened to her voice before. It wasn't such a good idea. Now the Lord's saying, listen to her voice. For in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman because he is your seed. Notice the Lord never calls him Abraham's son. Notice he never calls the bondwoman his wife. Because they weren't married in the eyes of God. They were married because Sarah said, here, have her. He's like, okay. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> anyway, he's upset. But the beautiful thing is Ishmael ends up having 12 princes. And we see this later on in chapter 25 as we go forward. We'll get there. Ishmael ends up being this great nation as well. And so Abraham is kind of worried about letting them go and having them cast out. And imagine you've got a 16 or 17-year-old boy who you've spent a lifetime raising, and now you have to say goodbye to him. I mean, that's tough. And the Lord says, don't let it bother you. Don't let it bother you. That says that I have control of my emotions. And God expects me to have control of my emotions. He expects me to see things the way he sees things, regardless of how I feel. And there are actions that I need to take regardless of how I feel. And God expects me to get my heart under control, like a horse with reins. Well, I'm just saying. No, you're not. You don't have to say. You know, I've got to say. No, you don't. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to be a knucklehead. You don't have to be a bonehead. You don't have to say everything you think. I have to tell myself that all the time. That's why there's a giant clock over there. And so Abraham rose early in the morning and he took bread and a skin of water and putting it on her shoulder, he gave it to the, he gave, he gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water in the skin was used up and she placed the boy under one of the shrubs and she went and sat down across from him a distance of about a bow shot. And she said to herself, let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat opposite him and lifted her voice and wept. If you enter into the emotion of that, that banishment, that abandonment. Any of you have abandonment issues? You've been abandoned and it's a hard issue. You read that and you say, really, Lord? What is that all about? I have a couple of questions of my own. Does this seem cruel and unusual? Is this a divorce? I've already answered that for you. She really wasn't a wife. Did she have a bad lawyer? Perhaps she got the short end of the stick because she didn't have a good lawyer. So what is up with this? And the Lord says, do this. Well, she was never intended to be part of the household. Neither was he. And I would love to say it's a happy mistake, but it's a mistake that has to be rectified by banishment. And that's incredibly sad. There are mistakes that we have made that tend to follow us around. And unfortunately, they can't be part of your identity and they can't be part of your future. And they need to be let go. Now, I thought of at least three reasons why this should happen. Number one, this is an indication of Abraham's faith. Well, why do I say that? Because he woke up first thing in the morning. The Lord told him, do what Sarah said. And he goes, okay, first thing in the morning, that's what he did. He got right on it. Notice, Abraham's not 
lying. He's not swindling. He's not negotiating. He's not compromising. He's obedient. The next morning, he got some water and he got some bread and he sent them off. It's an indicator of his faith. Number two, it's an illustration of the flesh. Sarah, um, Sarah and Hagar are completely opposites. And they have a picture in the scriptures. Ishmael and Isaac are two different covenants. One is the flesh, what we can put together, what we can make of ourselves, much like what Adam and Eve did when they covered themselves with fig leaves. And notice the Lord came along and said, nope, I'm not going to stand for any work of your own hands. I shall cover you. Your own covering is not enough that you put together. Besides, it's going to itch soon. It's a picture and an illustration of the flesh. That's what they were. And third of all, it's an illumination of my failure. It's an illumination of my failure. Let me explain. In Hosea 12.10, the Lord says this, I have also spoken by prophets and I have multiplied visions. I have given symbols through the witness of the prophets, symbols. It's interesting. When I said we don't take the word of God literally, it's because not every word is literal. Some of it's allegorical, metaphorical. It's a simile, right? There's a bunch of other words, but I won't bore you with that. And so God speaks by symbols. So there are things in the Old Testament which are a shadow or a type or a model of what's going to happen in the New Testament. And so is this. And so that's a reason why God allows this to happen and it's his plan. Let me show you Galatians chapter four, where it's given by Paul. He says, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by the bondwoman and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh and he of the free woman through the promise, meaning Isaac, which things are symbolic Interesting. Paul, the apostle, is giving us an interpretation of what this means. For these are two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, that's the law, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which is now and is in bondage with her children. Bottom line symbolizes bondage and the law. But the Jerusalem above, meaning in heaven, which is the mother of us all, who was according to the flesh, then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. So the one who was born of the flesh is persecuting the one born of the spirit, who's Isaac. And so it is to this day. Do you know all of the Arab nations are still persecuting Israel? It's a big argument about property, but it's more about inheritance. It's more about standing before God. And it is to this day, even as it was in this day 2,000 years ago. But now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son and the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of free. You know what that means? That means you are no longer a slave to sin. When you get born again, you get an inheritance, which means your sins are forgiven and the power over sin is granted to you by the Holy Spirit. You were never supposed to be a slave. You've been bought and paid for with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body, as it says. Amen? Yeah. Guys, understand this. That's good. So, there's an indication of Abraham's faith because he immediately went out. Number two, there's an illustration of the flesh because he is a product of the flesh. Ishmael is a product of the flesh. How many of you still have flesh? Some of you are just completely non reactive. Okay. <laughs> And this is an illustration of my failure. How is it an illustration of my failure? Well, according to the scriptures, 
as soon as you get a law, the natural man gets a law, hey, don't touch this. You tell a child, I have cookies in here, the most delicious cookies you've ever had in your whole life, but you can't touch them. I remember my daughter, she was very young, said, don't touch the stove, it's hot. And she looked at me and she went, I said, oh, a law pops up and suddenly rebellion is there. What's that about? If I tell you not to think of flying pink elephants, that's all you'll think of. Don't think, of, don't think about it. Don't, don't. It's an amazing thing, the sinful nature, isn't it? The other day I was out with some friends and we were going to a place where we were going to jump in a car and go very, very fast, 35 miles an hour. <laughs> and I tend to get sick on round and round rides and things that abruptly turn my head because I just have an inner ear weirdness. My kryptonite. <laughs> and I was getting sick just thinking about it. You ever get yourself all freaked out just thinking about something in the future? The power of the flesh. And you're not even experiencing it, but you know what? I start thinking of times when I got ill, I'll use the kind word, and I start thinking about it and I start gulping hard and feeling weird and like, I got to sit down, man. I'm not feeling well. I start turning pale because the flesh is an incredibly powerful mechanism. And without Christ in our life, you know, we're hopeless. We're like lemmings, you know. Anyway, the illumination of my failure, because the law never helps anybody be spiritual. Laws never help you to be right before God because we can't keep them. Red light. Don't go through a red light. Unless you're all alone and you know that other people are stopped, you know you got a second light to wait for. And there's nobody coming and there's no police officer in sight. Okay. Well, do you know that goes through my mind? Hagar is a symbol of the law. Ishmael is a symbol of the flesh. There is no inheritance for her. And there is no savior in him. Because Isaac is the one who's going to bring the Messiah. Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God. He's his predecessor. And because of Christ, we all have life. And that's never going to come through Ishmael. It's never going to come through a work of the flesh. It's always going to be a work of the spirit. Amen? Sarah is a symbol of grace. Why? Because there was no way she was having a child at 90. And there was no way that Abraham could father a child at 100. She's a picture of grace. And there is no way you can stand before God without Jesus Christ interceding for you like a lawyer. Because I'm going to stand before the judge, the righteous creator of all things, and he's going to read the list. How do you plead? Jesus will stand and say, he's guilty, your honor. Can I talk to you for a minute? Judge says, sure, approach the bench. And Jesus comes and whispers in his ear and he comes back to me. He goes, you're free. I'm free. And he takes off his suit and they put him in handcuffs and they take him away and they execute him. That's exactly what happens because Jesus came and died for my sin in my place. Amen. And it's because I have faith in him just by simple belief and faith that I'll make it. It has nothing to do with what stands against me because my goodness, the list is long. Mm -hmm. That's why we need Jesus. Amen. And Isaac is a symbol of the spirit. Verse 14. Oh, I'm so sorry. Romans 8. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. It's still the same, even in the New Testament. It's those who are born of the spirit that are born again, not of flesh and blood, but of the spirit, which is like the wind, where you don't know where it's coming from, where it's going. So it is of everyone who's born of the spirit. In Colossians 3, 5, and 7, it says, Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, 
evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry because you're worshiping an idol. You're not putting God first. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourself once walked when you lived in them. You see, the habitual behavior of a sinner is no longer what defines me because I don't do those things anymore. There, there came a last time I did speed. There was a last time I did heroin. There was a last time I smoked pot. There was a last time I slept around. There was a, and these things are no longer part of my lifestyle anymore because the Lord has made me new from the inside out. Yeah. And we are free, like the songs we sang today. We are free, truly free. Yeah. In Romans 6, verses 11 to 14, it says, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts, and do not present your members, parts of your body, as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead. You see, we live out the resurrection of Jesus Christ when we're born again. And your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. You would think, well, somebody who's under grace, they'll just do whatever the heck they want to do. Well, you have to read the rest of the chapter. Just because we're under grace, because God has forgiven us of our sin, it changes us from the inside. And I don't want to do the things I once did before, because I was trying to stuff things into an empty space that's now full. That's what it is to have a relationship with God, not a list of requirements and laws. That's what Hagar and Ishmael represent, the law, and about doing things your own way, regardless of what I did it my way song says. So it's an indication of Abraham's faith. It's an illustration of the flesh, and it's an illumination to my failure because I always have to walk away from my failures unfortunately. And God heard the voice of the lad. Notice who he heard in the wilderness. He heard Ishmael, who's a picture of the flesh. And God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, what ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Interesting, they're in deep trouble. God shows up and says, I heard him. Remember when she went out in the wilderness last time, when she ran away from Sarai? When she was pregnant with Abraham's child and the Lord spoke to her? Apparently she didn't believe it. And so the Lord answers his prayer. Arise, lift up your... Lift up the lad and hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. And then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. And so God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. It's interesting. You remember how far away she was from him? A bow shot. It's interesting. What's he become? An archer. Isn't that interesting? He dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him out of the land of Egypt. And so, because God came to them when he cried out, which tells me when we cry out to the Lord, he'll hear us. And we could be in the worst possible state. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come and learn from me, because I am meek and humble of heart. Take my yoke upon you, because my yoke is easy, my burden is light, and you will find rest for your weary souls. The Lord says, if this is the condition of you, I will hear you. Much like he did Ishmael, who's the picture of the flesh, cries out, and the Lord came and answered and gave them living water, water that made them alive. There are all sorts of parables in there as well. I will let you off the hook. 
So she sees water and she goes and she drinks of the water and they're able to live. And it says that they settle in the land of Paran, which is very, very south of Israel and it's a desert area. Um, so that's where they end up uh, settling in. And we're going to see later in chapter 25 all of the 12 princes and where they end up going and how that works out. Next week, we're going to look at Abimelech. He's going to come to... He's going to come to Abraham and make a covenant. He wants to make a covenant because he sees something in Abraham he doesn't understand. He sees the blessing of God regardless of whether he's a liar or not. And he wonders what in the world is that? And he comes to him and makes a covenant. So I'm going to ask the worship team if they could uh, come up and we're going to have a final song. Chapter 22, which is coming up next, speaks of a tremendous sacrifice that Abraham is told to make of his only son. And that's exactly how God explains who he is, who Isaac is. I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac, and I want you to bring him to a mountain where I'll show you, and I want you to sacrifice him to me. So we've gotten God asking for a human sacrifice, something that you never find in Scripture. It's a bizarre and it's a very moving picture and model for what God does 2,000 years later with the Lord Jesus Christ. So we'll look at that next time. Mm -hmm.